It's really an honor to be here when Scott uh, asked me to, he was going to put a TEDx talk together and it was about failure and I was one of the first people that came to his mind. It uh, gave me a really warm place in my heart because actually I believe we, we don't learn enough from failures. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is the project I've been involved with uh, for the last four and a half years called uh, Red Bull Stratus. Compulsory logos from all the uh, groups I work with. So uh, just three weeks ago, uh, Felix Baumgartner uh, made a jump from 128,000 feet and reached Mach 1.24. 65 years to the day after Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in an aircraft, uh, he, he broke the sound barrier and Felix shattered it. For a human to break the sound barrier without an aircraft is truly a remarkable feat. And so what I'm going to do is tell you the story of how I got involved with it. And uh, it dates back to my time at NASA uh, 2004 after the Columbia accident. I got involved with a group called the Columbia Sur Spacecraft Survival Integrated Investigation Team. And we spent four years going through the Columbia and other mishaps to learn all we could. And my role was to uh, uh, look at uh, lessons learned from previous uh, mishaps. And so uh, this was uh, the three weeks that we spent down at the, the Kennedy Space Center going through the debris. We went through the autopsy material. And we tried to come up with ways that we could think of that would enhance uh, s survival for crews that go to space. And obviously, this has become more important now with the commercial space endeavors. But it also has a personal note to me, uh, because my wife was on the Columbia. And uh, that's a picture of her with Ian. Um, and he asked me afterwards, why didn't she bail out? We were both uh, trained parachutists, and it really uh, it dug at me why they didn't. They broke up, the, the, the Columbia broke up about 148,000 feet, which is really only uh, 15,000 feet above where we jumped. A little bit faster, certainly more energy to deal with, but what was often said by the folks involved was, well, there was nothing we could do. And I vowed to prove them wrong. The book that came out after the investigation, uh, which you see there, uh, came out in 2008. It's like 800 pages, very technical, on the uh, specifics of how you could enhance survivability based on the, on the lessons learned. And then a year later, I wrote an article uh, which was in the journal of the British Interplanetary Sur Society called uh, Crew Survival Lessons Learned from the Columbia Mishap. And I did a lot of historical review of other events. And uh, the, the start of the article uh, was a caption that I dug up that is similar to the George Santana statement, but basically the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. And there were huge uh, overlaps with the Challenger Mishap and other mishaps, uh, space as well as aviation mishaps. And so with that, I wanted to start with a historical review and how it applied to the uh, supersonic freefall attempt that we uh, successfully completed three weeks ago. So if you take, uh, go back in uh, two, 200 years plus ago, uh, this was the first time that man left the planet. Animals left, other animals were sent up. Uh, but in, uh, in 1783, uh, in the very heart of innovation, uh, which was Paris, France, uh, groups found, uh, based on what they saw, hot air rising and p puffs of uh, paper rising, that they made balloons out of paper and hot, and hot air. Around the same time, they also discovered that there was a gas, uh, hydrogen, generated by electricity, and the breakdown of electricity, that hydrogen, also lighter than air, would also rise. And so, a week after the, the hot air balloon went up, a, a hydrogen balloon went up. And then two years later, um, a Frenchman named de Rossier said, well, if hot air rises and hydrogen rises, if I put them together, that'll make it even better. And uh, we can kind of imagine that there might be problems with that. And as, his, as, as uh, the unfortunate circumstances were to pass, he was crossing the English Channel. Uh, the hot air ignited the hydrogen, the balloon ruptured, and he perished uh, with his uh, co-pilot. 220 years later, 
the first successful uh, balloon flight around the world that was almost 20 days in length succeeded because they combined hot air and a lifting gas. Instead of hydrogen, they used helium. It was not a bad idea, it was poorly implemented. And the around the world attempt that was successful with the Pride and Orbiter 3 and the two other competitors all were using these Durosier hydro balloons. So it shows you that failure is in the eye of the holder. So now we're going to start into how we approach variable stress. And we uh, went through an extensive review of events, mishaps, and the like. And I'll just share with you a few of those. But believe me, we had over 40 different uh, hard lessons learned. One of them was uh, based on an attempt in the mid 60s by a civilian parachutist, truck driver from New Jersey, raised by the funds, talked to the big car company to blowing him a suit. And he attempted this three different occasions. He got into the uh, stratosphere. On the last one, uh, the suit depressurized and he was cut away, slow descent back to Earth. This is a picture of the castle coming down, taken by the physician flying in the Piper Cub that was circling the whole time and was actually prepared to jump out and land, but they actually landed the, the aircraft right next to him. I had the opportunity to do a fairly extensive debrief with him. But the problem was that when they decided he had an emergency and the suit had depressurized, it took too long in the death zone for him to get back to a safe, a safe uh, non-hypoxic environment. And so unfortunately, he suffered a severe anoxic brain assault and, and uh, died four months later uh, from uh, the consequences of the coma. We learned a lot from that. And what we learned was that if we're going to go up there, we want to bring, if we need to have an emergency, we want to get back down real quick. So the way we do that is we delay the parachute's opening with a, a reefing system that dies to serve. And this is a video of one of our uh, drops. Uh, you see the balloon ruptured as it pulls away the parachute on the capsule that would be bringing the injured person back is tethered so that it stays deflated until it gets to 20,000 feet and then it fully opens. And so this was how we specifically addressed that one issue. There were others in Nick Pionda's story, but I won't have time to go through all those. Project Excelsior was the Air Force test program in the late 50s and early 60s to test the escape suit that was being used by the Air Force. It was a partial pressure suit. It had a lot of issues. And uh, on the three attempts that Joe Kinder made, uh, he eventually got to 102,800 feet. On the first jump, however, he had a very serious problem that developed. And it was due to a uh, timer on the drogue. The drogue was something that we had found was very useful in preventing a skin. But if it comes out too early, it actually makes it worse. And so here what you'll see is a video as the drogue chute deployed and wrapped around Joe's neck, sending him right into the deadly flat spin they'd been trying to avoid. I wanted to look at my altimeter, which was on my left wrist. I had a great interest in my altimeter, because if I was low enough, I would have pulled my chute, because I really started to spin up quite rapidly. But the centrifugal force was so great, I couldn't pull my arms in. And then I passed out because of the, of the G-forces. And my emergency parachute opened uh, on schedule, at about 10,000 feet and saved my life because I was unconscious. So we realized that a drogue was useful in preventing a skin, but if it came out too early, it could be catastrophic. And so, uh, and if any of you saw the, the uh, footage from the jump, you realize that we also encountered a skin. Um, this was uh, Joe after his landing, and I had the opportunity to talk to uh, uh, Dick Chubb, who was his flight surgeon. So I had the opportunity to talk to the flight surgeon for Nick Pionda's case and also for, for Joseph Celsius program. And those guys were able to give you the real world insight behind the scenes. Unfortunately, a lot of this is not very well documented. There was another mishap, actually there were two SR-71 breakups, uh, but I'll just go through this one. Um, the vehicle had a uh, compressor stall, turned the vehicle sideways at Mach 3, that's not a very aerodynamic configuration, instantly broke apart. 
And the two uh, crew members were ejected from the, the uh, front of the, of the SR-71. And this is under the local papers. It was also published in Aviation Week and Space Technology a few years ago. Uh, and that's the test pilot, Bill Weaver. And uh, we actually uh, were able to track down the classified report and declassify it. And there were quite a few interesting points there. The backseat of the reconnaissance officer uh, got into a spin and his neck was broken. Uh, so we realized that a supersonic spin is probably not a good thing to be uh, encountered. And the other interesting thing was that Bill Weaver, who lives in LA, shown right here, um, shown as well with Joe Kittinger, was able to give us a lot of insight into what it was like in a Mach 3 uh, supersonic freefall. So to see that, it kind of like an airbag and protected him. Um, and his legs are fogged up, which is something we had experienced problems with uh, in our test program as well. But there's nothing like getting the, the first-hand experiences of the people that were there. And he was involved with the uh, test jumps out in California. We also know from the Columbia staff that the neck uh, was a very uh, likely to be injured from a helmet that was non-conformal. That like, a non-conformal helmet is like a fishbowl where you can move around inside. A conformal helmet is more like a motorcycle helmet. And that's obviously what we adopted in our program. It's a very uh, energy-absorbing, protective, motorcycle, uh, energy-dissipating kind of helmet that we use for stratus. So throughout the program, we were specifically taking uh, salient points and lessons learned for, for our program. Another program that the Air Force was involved with, which is classified, was called Project High Dive. And they launched 100 balloons in New Mexico and dropped two of these instrumented mannequins that looked very much like human beings, many of which were not recovered and were part of the alien story in New Mexico. That the Air Force was more than happy to, uh, to lean in that direction as opposed to what they were really doing. So, and, and that's actually in the, uh, the book called uh, Operation Project Blue Book, or Case Closed, and uh, if anybody wants an electronic copy, I can give you one. So, these instrumented mannequins were dropped, and they were, uh, and the half of them were instrumented, or half of them were fit with a drogue chute, the other half without. And the ones that didn't have drogue chutes could get up to 200 RPM. We actually have the test data from that. I could show you the, the boring graphs that we went through, but clearly, the higher that they, they were launched from, the more likely they would go into a spin. But the highest they ever tested was 90,000 feet. So we went into an extensive drogue development program. To break the sound barrier, we decided we weren't going to deploy the drogue unless we had to in case of a spin. But we went through a very elaborate test series, and this was one of the earlier test jumps. We uh, ended up with a 22-foot uh, length on the drogue chute, uh, the early one showed a mid-center mass uh, attach point, uh, and when we went through the test data that was stuff that we couldn't even do nowadays, it would be unethical, but the Air Force had done uh, human test data and spun people up, and uh, this data shows on the axis, the x-axis, uh, this is RPM, and this is 100 RPM, and this is in log scale time, this is 10 seconds and 100 seconds. So if you were rotating around your pelvis, you could tolerate 60 RPM for about 20 seconds before you would start experiencing ocular hemorrhage. And they had these nice uh, dose uh, response curves. And if you rotated around higher up, you could tolerate 100 RPM for 20 seconds. That's the, the end point for the test was uh, ocular hemorrhage. Um, but we ended up going with an attach point at the shoulder to raise the center of rotation. Now, what does that do? If you're in a spin and you're spinning, blood is going to be centrifugally pulled in two directions. One way is going to go to the lower extremities. That's called uh, G loss of consciousness because of pooling. And the other is going to go to the head, which is called a negative GZ spin or red out. And it would actually uh, could eventually lead to cerebral hemorrhage, which was the, the worst of the two con concerns. So we opted to move the center of rotation of the drogue as high as possible, accepting that he would lose consciousness over cerebral hemorrhage. 
And we actually developed a protocol based on the, the uh, stroke protocol for a, a red hemorrhage uh, based on that with, with critical care experts. So we did some drop tests. Um, this was one of the drop pods, which has been uh, slightly misspelled. Uh, his name is actually B-A-U-M-B-G-A-R. So we called it the bomb gardener, the different bomb. And we did two drop tests from 100,000 uh, feet. And this shows you one of the drops. Um, and what we found was a very nice aerodynamic structure did not get aerodynamic because it's weightless for a certain period of time. And uh, depending on the altitude, it's, it's, uh, it was weightless for uh, anywhere from 10 to 35 seconds. And so it's not a very good image, but what you saw and what was concerning to us is here's this nice aerodynamic structure that's just tumbling. And as soon as the drogue deployed, boom, it would come out of it. So then we went to the drogue system, which was a hand-triggered system uh, on his wrist that he had to hold for three seconds, and it would deploy. And it would only deploy once he's been out of the vehicle for 30 seconds, because we didn't want it to come out too early like what happened to Joe Kittinger. It also had a sensor, so if he was rendered unconscious and was unable to actually manually deploy it, if he reached three and a half G's, which would be equivalent to 60 plus RPM for, uh, for six seconds, it would fire. And then it was tested on a number of occasions. This is the test jumper, Luke Aikens, going out and going into a violent spin to deliberately trigger it. And you see the drogue fire and very quickly pull him out of it. Usually within a second or two, the, the spin is stopped. So we felt very comfortable in the system that was developed as a result of the preliminary historical review from all these other events. Interestingly enough, at the same time that the Air Force was testing their systems in space, the, uh, the Russians were doing it. So the Air Force was testing their, their pressure suits. The Russians were uh, even a higher level of sophistication. They actually took the ca capsule and, and it was basically a model of the Vostok escape system, which was the first six uh, Russian uh, launches into space used the Vostok capsule. They crammed two parachutists in there, and they tested the first one who ejected out and the second one who climbed out. And uh, they used very experienced test parachutists. Uh, this was uh, Colonel... Yegeny Andreyev, who jumped from 83,000 feet and set the free fall record for, uh, until Felix broke it on his 97,000 foot jump. And his cohort, uh, Major Peter Dolgoff, was the second guy out. And on, when he exited, his visor cracked. And he was exposed to the vacuum of space and uh, was dead uh, when they recovered him. So we knew that exposure to vacuum for several, and he was exposed for probably upwards of five to six minutes. There was also an unfortunate event that happened in the, in the Soviet space program during the first manned mission to the Soyuz space station. The Soyuz 11 crew, after 22 days in space, came back. During reentry, a vibration occurred and opened an equalization valve in the 400,000 foot range as opposed to the 30,000 foot range. The Russians had made a calculated decision. We could fly two crew in suits or three without. And going for a record, 22 days times three is, is over two months of humans in space. So they took that risk. And unfortunately, they suffered this, equal, uh, this depressurization problem. And all three of the crew uh, were on landing uh, unresponsive. One of my trips to Russia, I had the opportunity to meet with one of the crew recovery team, and they said they still had pulses. So they were in that border zone of being alive, but not quite. And that led us to a concern that we would mount a very large effort on, which was to develop a system for field management of exposure to vacuum in space. Now, this is Felix in one of the eight vacuum chamber runs and you'll see a glass or a jar of water at above this magic altitude 
of 63,000 feet is the vapor pressure of water. So water in a liquid state goes to spontaneously to a gaseous state. Your body being made up of water, 70%, that same thing happens to your, your body. Uh, and there have been survival exposures. Uh, one was in 1966 at Johnson Space Center in a suit. I have a video of it, but we don't have time to show it. But the, but the test participant says the last thing he remembers was his tongue boiling, and then he passed out. He was exposed for about 30 seconds, brought back down right away, made a very quick recovery. They sent him home that day. There was an industrial accident several years later. For three minutes, that person uh, was very seriously in, um, affected, but with critical care intervention, survived with no sequelae. So we knew that people exposed to vacuum for less than a minute could survive with very little care. For a couple of minutes, could survive with aggressive care. And maybe in the case of the Soyuz 11 crew, or in the case of the uh, Volga balloon uh, parachutist, if we had a field treatment protocol, we might make a difference. On the left here is a normal looking lung. On the right is an ebulism lung. And what you see is massive disruption of the alveolar sac, hemorrhage, et cetera. That lung pattern, the pathophysiologically looks very similar to shock lung in burn patients. And so and when our critical care experts were going over our procedures, they said, well, why don't you try a medical therapy that is used for the shock lung. And the therapy uh, is called high-frequency percussive ventilation. And this is Forrest Bird, who invented the bird respirator that saved many children. Um, he's a phenomenal inventor. And uh, his story is kind of interesting, too. Started out in World War II uh, as a pilot developing uh, G valves to, per, to increase pressure in the lower extremities. At the same time, his wife was dying of pulmonary disease, and he decided he was going to, after the war, he, he went to medical school, and he developed uh, a ventilator to help save her life. She eventually succumbed to the disease, but that was the start of the seed of his innovation that lasted to this day. He's 92 years old. He's the oldest helicopter pilot in the country. He has his own innovation museum up in Idaho. Uh, and he is a fervent supporter of the very kinds of things that are inspired by what we see here at the Henry Ford Innovation Institute. So he taught all of our team. We had eight physicians on our team, including three te uh, that would deploy with these ventilators in the field. And uh, this actually is the ventilator in the uh, medevac helicopter, and the two ground units carried the same uh, configuration. And basically what it allows you to do is it allows you to be ventilated with a very high frequency, low volume excursion so you don't disrupt the volume, uh, the damaged lung. And uh, so, so we think, although it's never been tried in a human, that it has at least a fighting chance to treat somebody who's been exposed to vacuum in the field. And that's actually something that's coming out in the publication, uh, Aviation, uh, Space, and Environmental Medicine. And it was one of my uh, master's students' uh, thesis project. So we saw a huge number of, uh, of, of very uh, important things that came out of this. This was the second jump. And uh, you'll hear the wind noise. He was uh, in weightless uh, environment for 16 seconds, almost 17 seconds. He went unstable. Uh, and he did six pirouettes uh, around the long axis. No big deal. Skaters do, uh, you know, uh, 500 RPM, uh, no problem. Um, on his uh, second jump, uh, he had a little more instability because he was weightless for 36 seconds. Um, and this was uh, to show you. This was the set. This was the last uh, uh, man balloon flight one attempt one. Every one of our flights, we had two unmanned and three manned flights. Um, we had a failure to start with, and it just regalvanized us. And what you see there is um, a launch that looked like it was going to go fine, and then we got hit with a gust of wind. And what I look at afterwards and say, thank God we weren't 30 minutes ahead, because if that balloon was a couple hundred feet off the ground and it got hit with that gust, it would have ruptured. He would have had a low altitude abort, and we would have been in a real bad situation.
So the point there is that failure was a very intimate part of our program in the planning and development stage and also in the execution stage because we never launched any balloon successfully without a prior failure. And the failures galvanized us to try, you know, the, it, it's one of those, uh, I guess you could say, uh, first you don't succeed, fly, fly again. We continually uh, uh, improved our performance and our uh, procedures based on failures. And after that failure, a week later, um, and you can play the music on this, it's kind of cool, we launched the 65th anniversary of Chuck Yeager's flight. This was a, a 750 foot long balloon train, 44 acres. Uh, that was uh, 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 about, and about a quarter of a million dollar balloon. Um, and another couple hundred thousand in helium. Uh, so we did it. Uh, we got to 128,000 feet, which is a little higher than we thought. Uh, this is us in mission control. Um, when the balloon gets to the final altitude, it's really, really uh, large. Um, you see the frost on the outside coming off. Uh, he does an exit. It's very hard to hear it in the pressure suit, so it sounds a little garbled. But basically, he says you have to come up this high to realize how small you are. And we did capture the spin uh, from the ground tracking cameras. Uh, it lasted about 40 seconds, but he did fine. Um, his uh, sensor didn't fire, and he didn't trigger it himself, and we did it. Um, that's a record that probably never will be broken. Any higher, any faster, without a drogue, and you're not probably likely to survive. And I'd like to end with this great quote. Um, the hilltop would not be nearly so wonderful were it not the dark valleys to traverse. And that's a quote by Helen Keller. Uh, defeat is just a, simply a sign to press onward. Thank you.